Welcome everyone. On behalf of the American Heart Association, I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Laura Peterson, Charitable Estate Planning Advisor for the American Heart Association. We have a great presentation today with two very special guests. We'll be exploring the fundamentals of estate planning with a special focus on unique issues that women face. Before I pass it over to our speakers today, Please allow me to spend a couple of minutes sharing our tremendous impact the organization has had thanks to many of the donors and volunteers that are with us today. I'm proud to share the association has turned 100 years old earlier this month. Yes, you heard me, 100. With 100 year old history, many people recognize the American Heart Association but we're often asked exactly what does the association do? When the association was founded June 10th, 1924, heart disease was considered a death sentence. The best option for many people, they were told, was bed rest. There was no treatment and no hope, but the association's founders didn't believe that. They felt that if only we understood heart disease, treatments would follow. And were they ever right? Fast forward to today, and not only are treatments, but proven ways to lower your risk for heart disease as well as stroke. Through scientific research and the power of millions of volunteers and supporters like you, we have a deeper understanding of many factors that contribute to these diseases, from traditional medical is issues such as high blood pressure, to societal problems, structural racism, and discrimination. And there's no letting up in the next hundred years. We're not just a charity. We're crusaders and innovators and scientists and partners. We're excited about the impact we'll make over the next hundred years as we remain devoted to a future of health and hope for everyone everywhere. So again, thank you for being here today for being part of our history and for being part of our future. Before we get started, I just wanna cover a couple of quick housekeeping items. Today's webinar is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide legal or tax advice. I'm sure many of you have attended a Zoom webinar over the past few years, but just a friendly reminder that you control your view simply use your mouse to drag the slide bar in the middle of your screen. Go ahead and give it a try. While you do that, I'll point out a couple more of the webinar functions. Although we can't see or hear you, we do want to hear from you. If you have questions, please use the question and answer feature on your screen. Following the presentation, we'll have a live question and answer session and answer as many questions as time permits. Right next to the question and answer button, you have the option to show captions during the presentation. To enable captions at any time during the presentation, simply click the show captions button on your screen. 
You may turn off captioning at any time by selecting the Hide Caption. It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar. Tiffany House serves as President and CEO of Gift Planning Institute and Tax and Estate Strategy, LLC. Her passion lies in inspiring donors to achieve more by leveraging tax-advantaged assets and creating lasting legacies. Her background is a financial advisor. Tiffany brings a unique approach to gift planning, incorporating both ethical and financial considerations. Mary E. Vandenack is a highly regarded practitioner in tax, trusts, estates, and private wealth planning. As a partner at Duggan and Burt, she manages the Omaha, Nebraska office. Mary's expertise extends as asset, asset protection planning, business succession, philanthropic strategies. Mary's diverse clientele includes business owners, executives, real estate developers, healthcare practitioners, and tax exempt organizations. We're incredibly grateful for both of you joining us today. To get us started, I'll pass it over to Tiffany. Thank you so much. It's uh, lovely to be here and lovely to be here with all of you. Uh, there's an interesting fact out there that 75% of the wealth is transferred to the next generation by women. Now, that might be a surprising statistic, but when you look at it, women typically outlive men. And some of us are not necessarily prepared to be having the, the, the financial things all in order. I know myself, I've been a financial advisor, but still my husband works with me a lot on all of the finances. So it's a really good idea if you do not have full control of all of your finances to be looking at it every year. So revisit your financial matters yearly so that you can be empowered when a transition occurs. Because Unfortunately, in life, uh, there are a lot of transitions. So we're here today to help you be prepared. Uh, we're also going to help you with incapacity planning. Unfortunately, that happens a lot where it might be a short-term incapacity or it could be nearing the end of life. There's very good planning that needs to be done to help you be empowered in those times when you don't feel empowered. Uh, we'll also go through basic estate planning and how to coordinate all of your financial assets. Uh, we will speak a bit on charitable gift planning for helping great organizations like the American Heart Association to accomplish the great work that they do. There's some tools that can provide you income and give back. So we'll go over a few of those. And we just wanna make sure that you are prepared. As women, we need, we're need we often the ones who are helping everyone else. We need to make sure that we're helping ourselves and that we're being prepared. And then Mary, would you like to go over our goals and objectives? So, yes. and. Actually, I think so. You've kind of talked about what we're trying to cover today. And what I just like to say is, is I'm not going to go through each of these individually, but what's really important when you're working with your planning process is to actually make sure. And I always say is make sure that you're working with an advisor. I know I'm what I call an objective based planner. So there's not one plan that works for everybody. It's what really matters to you. And these are just some of the goals and objectives. And sometimes when I ask a client, hey, what are your goals and objectives? They're like, oh, I don't really know. You know, some people want to worry about, some people are worried about saving every possible dollar of tax. Some people don't care. Some people are very focused on their charitable giving and all of those different things. But the key th point on this slide is really simply making sure that you are working with a planner, and I kind of say if your planner isn't asking you about your goals and objectives, then reconsider whether that's the right planner for you. Um, but that should be the first step in the process. And before you even walk into media, I think like sometimes if you're working with a financial planner first, a lot of times they are actually really good at that. Sometimes when you get to the lawyer, sometimes, and that's you know what I do is some of us are just like, oh, this is the basic plan that we all use. And I think it's really important that you find an objective-based planner. So 
One thing I'll add to that is everybody's situation is so unique and so different. So it is really key to define your goals and objectives. And so on this next slide, we're going to talk about how to maximize wealth. And so I think, Tiffany, like your comment is some people now, I've been on my own. So that's been my thing to learn and have done a lot of education. But I think whether somebody's in a relationship or on their own, learning how to maximize wealth is so important. And I was just hoping you would speak to this a little bit. Sure. Well, it's always good to be proactive. And when we're in times like we are now with such high rates, with inflation getting so high, if you're not doing, if you're not planning with your money, if you're sitting on the sidelines just in cash or not necessarily taking a look at it, you could be losing money with inflation where it is today, especially. So it's uh, great to optimize your tax efficiency, making sure that you're choosing the best assets to utilize, to uh, to sell and when you need them, uh, especially when you move into retirement, you want to make sure that you're considering that. Uh, again, goal planning. It is so important to have clear and concise goals so that, you know, I've had clients who say, I want to leave my kids as much as possible. I'm building my wealth for my children. I've had other clients who say, I want to die with nothing. That would make me uh, the happiest thing out there. So having your goals will help you determine how to do your budgeting, how to save and invest. Um, it's also really good to diversify. So having different levels of income coming in can be very helpful. We're going to go through some tools, one of them called a gift annuity, a charitable gift annuity that is not market correlated, but can provide you income. So sometimes it's good to to look at some of those different options. Uh, also looking at debt and what is good debt? What is bad debt? If you got a mortgage on your home in the last uh, five years and your interest rate is under 4%, that might be a mortgage that you want to hang on to because your money can be making more for you invested in other types of assets uh, than paying off that mortgage. So it's great to reduce debt. You want to pay off your highest debt first, of course, uh, but look at it and see where your money can be actually working for you you. Uh, asset protection is uh, key. You want to make sure that your assets are protected. And we'll get into that with estate planning and how you can accomplish that with a good estate plan. Uh, and we all need to continue to educate ourselves and to have good advisors around us that we can trust that keep our fiduciary needs uh, at top of mind. Tiffany, thanks so much. I have to tell you that I'm a person who has like a 2.1% mortgage and I have trouble not paying it off because I really hate debt. And so my brother talked to me into like, hey, Mary, put all of this. He's actually a wealth strategist. She's like, put, set, put all that cash in a fund and you can cash out the growth every year and then put that payment on auto pay so that you resist the temptation to write a bigger check every month. And that really worked. Well, let's talk a little bit about how what we do kind of goes together and that estate planning and wealth maximization really and truly work together. And I did put asset protection at the top of this list because I think it's sort of the, people think about estate planning and I really think that word should be used as life planning rather than estate planning because if it's an estate, you're dead. And what really matters more in my opinion is well, I'm still alive and you know, when I'm dead, sure I care, but I actually care a lot about what happens while I'm alive. And I think one of the most underutilized and under people are, you know, really could use more education and asset protection. And there's a lot of simple ways. For example, even to the extent you have an investment account, you could simply wrap an LLC around it and it might be an estate that's not your own state and doesn't have any state income tax. Like we use Wyoming a lot of times. So there's little simple strategies like that, which by the way, also can have some potential income tax benefits, which I don't really have time to go in today, but that is the next topic is tax minimization. So an estate plan isn't just about, hey, here's a trust and will and what happens when I'm dead, but let's look at particularly, let's say you're somebody who does like to make charitable gifts and the American Heart Association is extremely important to you. So let's say you're not subject to the current 13.61 million estate tax exemption, then maybe we look at a more of a giving plan 
during life, things like that. Probate avoidance. Yeah. I will tell you that there's a lot of lawyers who make good money on probate. There are some states that are starting to say, yeah, you know what? Really not avoiding probate is malpractice. There's no reason really to put through people through probate. Now, I'm going to just tell you, I've heard all the reasons why people say you should go through probate. I would respectfully say probate avoidance is something that you should. I'm a fan of the revocable trust versus using TODs, but there's a lot of diverging opinions on that. Um, and business if I could on that, just yeah. to clarify probate so that everybody has a good understanding, uh, when you haven't made a plan, the government will make a plan for you. And when it comes to estate planning, I know estate sounds like a big word, but all of us have an estate. If we have any assets, if we have a home, if we have a car, that's our estate. And so when you hear estate planning, like Mary said, it should be life planning, uh, but really don't get intimidated by it. Don't think that it doesn't include you because it does include all of us. And if we don't create an estate plan for ourselves, the government has one. So if you don't have things in a uh, trust, uh, when you pass on any assets over a uh, hundred thousand or 75,000 in two different uh, brackets, but assets over that then have to go to the courts and the courts are going to go through and determine how they, are going to be transitioned and you could have written a will and the will is going to dictate and the courts are going to take a look at that but attorneys get involved fees get involved it's public people can see what you have and it looks laura like you have a question for us thank you for letting me jump in tiffany and mary we do have a live question that came in do you believe that all heirs should be treated equally <laughs> Okay, uh, that that's a totally loaded question. And before we answer that, I just want to follow up on one point on the probate avoidance. Because so I think, Tiffany, you were talking about two topics. If you die with no will, you die intestate, and everything does go through a probate, and the state that you live in decides where your stuff goes. But if you do only a will, you will still go through a probate. And two to three percent of your estate goes to attorneys plus other expenses, which can be avoided with the trust administration. As far to whether beneficiaries should be treated equally, that's a big go back to slide one on objectives. What is your family structure? What you know is and and there's ways to treat you know family members and beneficiaries equally and unequally in the same time. And what I will tell you is when somebody is incapacitated that the person who shows up and provides care is valued and should be valued. Because I can tell you that I see that every day and the kid who's around taking care of mom or dad and the other kids get upset, but that's a, it's a lot of work. So it's a question. The other place, which is the next on my list, that, that becomes an issue is business succession planning. What if you have a business and one kid is involved running it, building the value of that business, the other three kids are off doing other things. Should they all get an equal share of that business, even though kid number one is the one actively involved in growing it? And there's no right answer to that. It could go either which way. So I think that's a very fact-based question that goes to what are the client's objectives and family facts? Did you have any other thoughts on that question, Tiffany? Yeah, you know, I have seen that. And when you're going to leave a child out and not be equal, you need to be very careful in your planning because the last thing you want is to have that child that it was unequally uh, uh, gifted to or an unequal beneficiary is having them come at their siblings and creating family acrimony when you're incapacitated or no longer here. So I had an interesting case. I had a uh, client who had a dermatology practice, a husband and wife, and they had three sons. The oldest son, literally there was something called Shoegate. Uh, they, did, they were in a fight with him about the grandson who was a runner and uh, he got mad at them uh, for buying his son's shoes. And so they have had, they, they don't get along. What we did with them is they didn't leave him out of their estate plan. They left it equal in their estate plan. But when we sold their practice, we used a charitable remainder trust and we added, uh, they, they were then able to get 
income for life. And we added a term of years of 20 years for their two good sons. And we left the son that was uh, not in favor out of that plan because that was an irrevocable trust and he could not go after that. And the reason we were so afraid of him coming after it, anyone could do it, but he was also an attorney. So they were able to create that inequity, uh, utilizing some good planning where they're not putting their other two sons in jeopardy of their brother coming after them after the fact. So if you're going to do it, do good planning. And uh, I've even recommended to people, if you're going to leave a kid out or all the kids out, go back and sign your trust a few different times uh, so that you can show that that was truly your intentions. Well, and work with a good attorney. And can I just make sure you guys can hear me? I had a slight sound. Okay. I can so, hear you just fine. Um, one of the things is, like what we do is we create good documentation of testamentary intent. But I also suggest like another item on this slide is family harmony is communicate with your family members about what you're doing and why. A lot of people don't want to do that, but you do prevent a lot of family harmony. So I do want to just say incapacity planning. I think I've kind of hit on that. I think incapacity planning is as or more important than sometimes the trust or will. Again, even if your family members fight afterwards, you are dead. And you don't want that, but I'm like, okay. But if you are incapable of taking care of yourself and you have some wealth and you know that incapacity plan, we're gonna talk about this a little more. And I asked Tiffany to cover a couple things specifically that she will. So we'll come back to that. Um, legacy preservation and what that means for anybody, for some people it might be their homo collection. For some people, like I recently helped a client um, who actually designated me to make significant charitable gifts on their behalf in their name for their legacy, but they weren't sure what charities would be doing what at the time of her death. But thinking about, does that matter? And sometimes it's a matter of preserving legacy in the form of just information about the family that um, there's a lot of services to do. The most important thing is have a professional team of collaborative advisors. There is nothing useful about having advisors who don't talk to each other and don't get together in the same room because then it's like they go see Tiffany and they say, oh, Tiffany, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Tiffany's like, what was Mary thinking? And then they come see me and I'm like, well, what was Tiffany thinking? But if we get on the phone, we're on the same page. So I'm big about having meetings where all of us are involved. And I would just tell you that you will be much better served by bringing the minds into the same room. One of the things in the planning, and this is something, and I know Tiffany's not currently doing the financial planning, but when you know I'm doing the legal side of the estate plan, it's hugely helpful to have a detailed inventory of your financial assets. And we're not gonna go through this stuff at all line by line, but it's just a matter, this is a list that you can take a look at that you should gather. Some of the things, you know, if there's any premarital agreements, if you owe a former spouse, you know, who is still having to sign off on real estate, it's important for us to know if you have long-term care. And fortunately, I'm really blessed to work with fabulous financial advisors who almost always are able to kind of spoon feed us some of the information to uh, help us with this planning. The other thing is the non-financial assets and a lot of times the planners, and, and I know Tiffany in her work spends a lot of time helping families just kind of navigate a whole lot of issues, but is gathering family information, talking about family business, the relationships, like, we, you know, the question that we are asked about, you know, whether you can do different things for different beneficiaries, what are those interfamily relationships, all of these being really important to talk about. So, I want to talk about what the basic estate plan looks like. And so your key tools really are these categories. There's a lot of other fancy tools that you can add in, but the basic tools are a revocable trust. And that's, you know, the thing. And I have to tell you, I've written a lot about why should you consider a revocable trust? And anybody who's listening to this webinar, if you want to copy that, I'm happy to provide it to the American Heart Association and they can distribute it to you. So, but it's a great way to help you protect assets, to avoid the probate that we talked about. And then to the extent we use a revocable trust, we have this little thing 
called a poor overwhelm. And all that that really means is that, hey, if for some reason I didn't get all my assets titled in trust, like everything I own in my house is titled Mary Vandenack as trustee of the Mary Vandenack Living Trust. But if I miss something, I have a will that says, oh, by the way, everything goes into my trust anyway. Healthcare directives, I'm going to tell you that sometimes people see these as a form. I'm a person who does deathbed advocacy and act as guardian and as healthcare power for numerous clients. For some reason, I have the strange gift of being good at a deathbed. This is one of the most important things that you can talk to your advisors about and make sure you have in place. And then there's your legal power of attorney, which is also, so those are kind of your four basic tools that you want to have in place. There's and again, a so whole important. lot of important. Yeah. And really I was just cool. going to hit on the fact that those yeah. are, it's a, it's very important to have that planning and to um, have it coming from while you're in life and you can think through it. And I always like to think of it as kind of ruling from the grave. How do you want things to come about? And I'll share personally. Um, so I have a revocable living trust and I have a daughter who is a bit wayward. My oldest, I have three daughters. My 21 year old is dealing with some addiction issues. And so we put things into our trust to protect so that if we're no longer here, we're not going, we can then have some control in the future. So it's very important planning to do. And I'm just going to acknowledge I have a wayward son. And so I'm grateful to be in the business because gee, I can edit mine. So, you know, also, the trust, the revocable trust, typically you name yourself as trustee of that trust while you're alive. So again, I have a trust. It's Mary Vandenack as trustee of Mary's Living Trust. And by the way, you don't have to name it after yourself, and it doesn't have to be formed, created in the state that you live in. People sort of assume that, but those are questions to ask. What happens is if I become incapacitated, then I have a successor trustee. That successor trustee can step in and deal with my assets, make sure that I'm covered and taken care of. While you can also do this to some degree with a financial power of attorney, I will tell you that the revocable trust is a little bit of a, is very much a stronger tool than just having a power of attorney in place because a trust will never fail for the absence of a trustee but if your power of attorney is deceased, somebody has to go get a conservator, or let's say they're off on a cruise drinking too much, or they're suddenly in jail, or any number of weird things that happen if you name a human as your power of attorney. A trust will always have a mechanism to create a future trustee. So this also does these other things, the estate tax planning, what Tiffany talked about, which my trust is actually what's called a directed trust, which is a whole seminar in and of itself. But I have a distribution committee that kind of just makes decisions about my son and what he should get with some direction. Any last thoughts on that slide, Tiffany? Uh, no, I think you uh, covered it well and uh, just good to have the plan in place. And so I've kind of already mentioned the pour over will and it really, just as a compliment to that revocable trust, it could end up with you having some assets go through a probate. Obviously, in my world, um, that's I generally try and avoid that and have no assets go to probate. And will be tell you that I know other attorneys say, oh, clients will never follow through. But we give really detailed directions. And I will acknowledge that it's very rare that I have a client that ends up in probate. In fact, I don't know how to find my way to court. So I'm really proud of that fact. <laughs> Laura, do you have on. a question for us? I do. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. We had a live question come in. Can you talk more about how you're dividing your assets among your children dealing with your wayward children? 
Yeah, well, I think Mary touched on it in her uh, trust. She has a team of people that need to come together to determine how to distribute the assets. Uh, for me, we have different uh, milestones so that the children, after they become of age, of course, they'll be taken care of because I have a 16-year-old, a 19-year-old, and the 21-year-old. Uh, so the 16-year-old will have all of her needs met uh, and and they can all go to college and use funds like that. And then we have part of the assets coming out in four different timeframes, 25, 35, 45, and 55. And we chose a uh, corporate trustee so that it's nobody in my family or my husband's family that needs to make the decision or have my daughter come after them and, and try and persuade or, uh, you know, uh, get some funds ahead of time. But because we have three girls and, you know, girls can be a little competitive. We wanted to try and make it as equal as possible, but spread it out over time. And if there is addiction, if there's um, an ongoing uh, problem, then the uh, trustee then can, the successor trustee can make the decision not to distribute the assets. But we didn't want to give, so the, the successor trustee has some powers and it sounds like Mary's a uh, team of distribution people have a lot more power. You can choose, and that's what you can do with a, a, a good trust. So, I'll, so give much. A, I'll give a slightly different scenario that might be useful. So I, historically, um, it was really common to use those distribute one third at 30, one third at 35, one third at 40. I'm an asset protection expert. So I started saying to clients, and I will just share this story briefly. I had a very successful 55-year-old executive in my office with his mother, and we were working on mom's estate. And he said, please explain to my mother that she leads, needs to leave my inheritance for me in trust. At that time, I was a much younger attorney. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're very successful. You're... And he looked at me and says, Mary, exactly. I'm a litigation target. Right. And so I started doing this planning, which has become more common, which says to the extent that you're going to give the assets outright, consider the possibility of asset protection. Because if I create a trust for my son, that's what's called a third party trust. I've created it for somebody else. It has fairly good asset protection. But a lot of people, there's these trusts called domestic asset protection trusts where I can go up to South Dakota, Nevada, Delaware, Tennessee, and various other states and create a trust for myself. Those are self-settled asset protection trusts, much less likely to help. So if I say, give your children a gift that they can't give themselves by considering putting their trust in life and leave their stuff in trust for life. Let instead of deciding what age they get the assets, decide what age they get to be trustee. Because the minute they're trustee, they can just get rid of the trust. But I will tell you that 98% of my beneficiaries, when they're the trustee and I explain the benefits, by the way, if you leave this in trust and you get divorced, your spouse can't get to it. By the way, if you get sued, the, the you know litigants can't get to it. And by the way, if you get disabled, this is a pot that will be available to you. So they have good access to it. They're the trustee. And we have certain strategies that I don't have time to explain to provide that asset protection in trust. So for my son, that's what I have is a trust for life with at a point that he can become trustee. Um, I do do equal shares. I think that's important that you don't want to treat your kids differently. So when you have the one kid who's a little wayward, then you don't want to necessarily treat him differently and say bad boy. But if you can create these trusts flexibly enough to take care of the kids who are doing really well and protect the one who might be struggling. So that's kind of my thoughts on that topic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what a financial power of attorney is. And this is a document that says, hey, if I, for some reason, um, can't act, although it can be durable, which means they could act now. But what we have is I am the principal and I name somebody who's called an attorney in fact, and they can make certain financial decisions for me. State laws vary. 
and they vary dramatically, by the way. We have a uniform power of attorney act, but every state can adopt its own version. So what I tell anybody is, yeah, make sure you look at your own statutes. But most statutes have a form. I would tell you it's all nice. I have clients go out, print the statutory form and sign it. But oh, at least review it with somebody because if you don't understand the powers that you just gave somebody, that can be somewhat of a big deal. It's really important. So the typical authority, it's a pretty broad power. And you have, you know, again, there's certain powers that you have to say. So I always tell people, why is the power of attorney? You know, six pages long. Well, because the first line says, you have all the power that you can have under state law. But then what really happens is some court comes out and says, well, you couldn't have possibly meant that you really wanted to give that particular power. So unless this document actually says it, you can't do it. And those are often what we refer to as these hot powers that are gifting. Do you want the person you name as your attorney in fact? So if you're incapacitated and you've been making gifts to your children every year, do you want that power of attorney to be able to make gifts? That answer could be yes, it could be no. What matters is it's a conscious decision. Do you want your attorney in fact to be able to create or amend a trust for you? And once upon a time, I'm like, oh my God, absolutely never give that power. And then I lived long enough to take care of dying clients who and do deathbed planning. And I'm like, well, maybe that power should be there. Beneficiary designations. On the one hand, beneficiary designations, changing them is the most common way people interfere with testamentary intent. So you name a kid as an agent who decides his siblings were jerks. And so they change all the beneficiary designations and name themselves. And I've actually had several cases where that's happened. So I like to name co-attorneys in fact, so there's accountability. But on the other hand, if they have beneficiary designations that are incorrect, incomplete, um, it's nice to consider that power. So the hot powers need to be considered. One other thing I'll say is that you should create one power of attorney with your attorney. And I do know that all 50 states have laws that say, if you create that power of attorney, um, a financial institution, a lot of times when you go in, say to Wells Fargo, they'll say, oh, we want you to sign our power of attorney. The answer is no, I have this power of attorney that I created with, because you don't want 10 different powers of attorney sitting out there. Any thoughts on that, Tiffany? That's a great point. Yeah. It, it, um, thank you for mentioning that to just have the one power of attorney and not have the conflicting because it makes when you have your successor trustee, your power of attorney, these are people that step in at a time of probably chaos in life. Either you or someone has passed or incapacity. And so it's already emotional. And if you have conflicting documentation, that can just make the job all that much harder in a very emotional time anyway. And so when does the attorney in fact begin? And there's two types. There's one that's durable that it begins immediately. So if I sign a document making Tiffany my attorney in fact, and I give her the power to manage my financial account, she could clean out my investment accounts today, right? So first I better trust her. Second, I have to decide exactly what powers I wanna to give to her and have it be durable. One of the things I do is tell people, well, you know what, sign the durable power of attorney and like, let's just keep that document in my office, in my vault, and just tell your attorney, in fact, where it is. So when they need it, they can come get it. The other type is what's called a springing power of attorney. And we do use these, but the durable power of attorney is actually more common because you want to, you're trying to avoid having to go to court and having somebody named as a conservator when you're incapacitated. So again, you are planning ahead when you're well and chatting with Tiffany and I, as opposed to after the fact planning. If you are already incapacitated, there might be a fight among people about who gets to be your conservator. So you want to decide who your attorney in fact is. I will tell you that my worst story ever was telling a very old woman that her son had spent all of her money under her power of attorney. 
So I am a big advocate of naming co-attorneys, in fact, or using professionals. Um, and there are there's a limited number of people, professionals that will. So sometimes some kind of co-attorney, in fact, but just do consider some accountability in this type of planning because I don't want a power of attorney to go in and you know, see Tiffany when she was managing investments and say, yeah, I need 250000 to buy this vehicle or whatever. doesn't matter that mom needs that money to cover her health care or whatever. So um, that's kind of the important thing there. Any other thoughts there, Tiffany? I just kind of want to hit on a slightly different um, subject with it and back to children. So when my uh, two daughters, my oldest two daughters turned 18, we went in and got them uh, all of the powers of uh, attorney. So health care power of attorney and financial power of attorney. And that's important because even though your children, especially now as kids might be going off to college, if you have uh, kids in that time frame, but everyone needs this kind of planning. Because if your daughter who is still on your insurance has to go to the hospital and can't make a decision on her own, if you don't have these powers of attorney for your children, then you're going to have to go to court to then be the one to be able to make those decisions and go in front of the judge and, and to, to get that. And so this is um, healthcare power of attorney and financial power of attorney are something that everyone should have, including our children. Thank you for that super excellent point. When we have clients come in, we actually dock it when their kids turn of age and just send them a little reminder. Cause I've had one too many stories where somebody calls me and their kid got in a car accident, you know, hundred miles away or 500 miles away and, and they can't get information cause they don't have a power of attorney. So that is just as your kids turn of age, whatever that age is in your estate, you should get both at least some form of legal power of attorney and a healthcare directive, which is our next topic. So again, these terms vary state by state, but I'm going to refer to the kind of two generic terms that you hear. And one is what we call the right to die will, which essentially says, hey, if I'm in a persistent vegetative state or terminal condition, I don't want any extraordinary life support, whatever that might actually mean. I don't want any artificial nutrition or hydration, which means you have to be force fed by a machine. And I want total relief from pain, even if it shall shorten my life, which personally having witnessed a lot of people dying, I'm like, I definitely want total relief from pain. So, but everybody feels differently about that. And so then there is, but I'm just telling you, I'm not a big fan of that one page document that says that because I've never seen the healthcare profession actually care about that. I've served on the Uniform Law Commission and there's a new act, which we'll briefly mention that kind of takes into the fact that there's currently medical disagreement on brain death. And so the language is changing to, hey, if I'm unconscious and it's unlikely that I'm ever gonna be conscious again, then you know, please discontinue support. Personally, I like the power of attorney for healthcare and you can take this right to die will and incorporate it into a power of attorney. So that says, so say I do when I say I name and not my son, because my son would keep me alive forever. So I have a good friend who I have named as my power of attorney, is my attorney in fact for healthcare decisions. And this kicks in when I'm incapable of making healthcare decisions. I don't have to be incompetent or almost dead. Let's just say I was in a car wreck and I'm you know, unconscious. She can make decisions for me. Then, but if I become to this state where I'm going to die, let's just make that really easy to say, then I have a direction in there that says, okay, I want one physician and then I want a second physician, but chosen by my agent. And this is really important because I'm in a city where there's teaching hospitals. And I had a situation where a hospitalist, because it's not your own doctor that comes to the hospital anymore, hospitalist walks in and then says, oh, she's he's dead. And here, resident, you sign off, he's dead. My client is still walking around today. So it's really important to consider the mechanisms that kick in. The new laws are starting to allow mental health directives and then a concept called supported decision-making, like you just need some help making the decisions. 
And those are all, again, topics in and of themselves. I'm sure either of Tiffany and I are happy to share additional information, but just trying to get you introduced to the concepts for today so that you know you're out there. Some states have a document called an end of life sustaining order. And you should inquire about that because what really matters is if you develop a certain condition, what you want or don't want for that condition is gonna matter at that time. And you take that document in and discuss it with your physician with respect to that condition. Because if you're totally well right now, discussing what treatments you do or do not want, that's a little bit of an exercise in, you know, who knows. So that's, those are kind of some of the concepts in this area. Any thoughts there, Tiffany? Uh, no, thank you. So again, I've kind of covered that. So co-attorneys, in fact, it's a big area of debate. I kind of like them because I used to have family members come into my office and it'd be like, you unplugged mom, you know, and too soon or things like that. So if we have co-agents, then, you know, it's like not that they've actually have to have conversations with each other. I had some therapists tell me you're just going to create work for the mental health community, <laughs> but I haven't had that happen for me it's actually been a significant improvement in terms of what I see. So I mentioned that there's this new Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act. I've been so blessed as to serve on this. And I think this is a much better act. I'm actually advocating for it in various states, but it's something just to the extent you're doing this, ask your attorney to take a look at it because a lot of them don't know about it yet, but it's a much more modern act. Well, Tiffany, let's talk about fiduciaries and selection of advisors. So this is a big deal. We've talked about this revocable trust, and you and I both have one, and we're our trustees while we're alive. But then you, and I think you have a spouse that I heard you mention, so you're, uh, you're both gone. And now it's somebody, and you named a corporate fiduciary. So can you just kind of tell us what does that mean, and why did you choose a corporation? So we chose a, a corporation. So we chose someone outside of our family, somebody who does not know our family, who will read the document and act uh, from the document because of our wayward daughter. Now for my healthcare and my financial powers of attorneys, those currently are, of course, to my husband first, um, but then my siblings. And as you age, you want to make sure the people that you chose are still of capacity to be able to act. So as I get older, I'm going to want my children to be able to be the successor trustee or the successor attorney, in fact, for my powers of attorney, because I, they, they will certainly be there, but I'm waiting for them to just get a little bit older. I, I could probably make this shift now, but that's why it's really important to review your documents often, because who you choose is very important. And as Mary mentioned, you can have two people make the choice, but what if they don't really get along well? If I had my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter doing it together, that would not work. But my middle daughter and my youngest, they would come together great. So you have to consider personalities, who you can trust, and what their motivations might be at that time. So um, it's a very personal decision to make, and it can be different people for every document. Uh, my mom has me, we call it the pull the plug. My sister can make her healthcare decisions, but I'm the one who gets to determine when to pull the plug on her, because everybody knows in my family, I have a a lot of animals. I'm the one who'd be like, okay, you know, it's time. Uh, so for different aspects of your plan, you can choose different people. And that's really important. And the one question I was going to throw at you was, let's just talk for a minute about the financial power of attorney. If we have the revocable trust and the investment accounts are titled in that revocable trust, successor trustee is going to act. So like in your case, currently, you're incapacitated, spouse is incapacitated, that successor trustee is a corporate trustee subject to a whole lot of rules and regulations. You can feel fairly comfortable that you're not gonna be my client whose kid spent all the money on the Maserati or whatever it was. I'm being a little facetious. I think he paid off his mortgage, but you know, at the end of the day, you're gonna get cared for. 
Yes. And, you know, there's another good point in here that I haven't mentioned about my um, trust is we have, so the three daughters, so instead of 33%, they're only getting 30% because we have 10% of our estate going to charity. And we chose seven different charities to receive that 10%. And when we sat our kids down to say, kids, sorry, you're getting, you're, you're not going to get that three and a third percent. Uh, they were like, oh, of course we get it. We know how charitable uh, you are. So you can create legacy beyond just your heirs in your documentation as well. And there's a whole lot of ways to do that. And we're going to kind of move along so we can talk about that part because we're both chartered advisors of philanthropy. And so that sh shows that little cap behind her shows that we both love philanthropy, but just some other incapacity plan is to review your plan regularly. This is not something you should do, put on the shelf and ignore for five years. I suggest in reviews, make sure you look at long-term care, plan for the unexpected. Um, and I always say most plans fail due to failure to implement. I'm working with a client currently who basically, and paid us quite a bit of money, to be honest, to do his trust and wills, but to date hasn't followed up by getting everything funded and into his trust. So it's important to talk about, okay, how do I implement it? And so I'm not going to go through all of these details about different ways to assets pass, but I know what I do in planning is I work with the other advisors in the picture. And what we do is make sure that we have every beneficiary designation and every asset title coordinated with the estate plan so that to the extent you've put together a trust or will or whatever document, that that all works. So some of the common ways that you do transfer again to a trust, joint tenancy, tenancy in common. Some states have this beautiful thing called a tenancy by the entireties, which is great asset protection. By the way, beneficiary designations, I give a whole presentation on all the ways that people screw up beneficiary designations. So, you know, that's something to just don't just fill it out online with whatever you think. I would talk to somebody who knows about it. And then a funding revocable trust. So, again, I'm a big advocate of that. Is your trust funded, Tiffany, or is that an unfair question? I know it is funded. I will say I have had clients though that have come in, spent a, a spent money on their estate plan. They feel all good, and we take a look at it, and there's no assets in it because they haven't done the funding. So you need to change your bank accounts. You need to have the title of your home and any of your other major assets. Uh, Mary mentioned putting assets in LLCs for asset protection. I'm a horse person. I own all my horses inside an LLC just in case. Um, I'm in the middle of Scottsdale. Scottsdale, Arizona is great because you can have horses in the city. Um, but if they get out on the road and somebody hits them and dies, uh, they can't come at me. They can only go after uh, what is in my LLC. So um, also fun, making sure your LLCs and assets are titled to your trust is a key component of having an estate plan. So you just said my favorite term, using LLC, it creates that asset protection feature of the planning. So coordinating the different types of assets. And on this slide, I've just used an example where sometimes people will do like second marriage. So I'm going to give an IRA, but they don't cover in their documents exactly whether the IRA is part of their estate for those purposes. And I call this unintended consequences. So one of the things you want to work through with your financial advisor and attorney is exactly how everything flows. Get them to draw you a flow chart. And so we've kind of talked about this asset retitling. It can be daunting. There's a lot to coordinate. I always tell people, I used to say once upon a time, oh, it's easy. It's not easy. The first time you do it, it's kind of a pain. But once you're in the habit of doing it's easy to continue and to follow through. Well, let's talk a little bit about one of our favorite topics of both of us is charitable planning. Tiffany, what do, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. And kind of to go back to your example with an IRA, it's very important to understand what your assets are because something like an IRA or other retirement assets, 
those are going to pass to the next generation and they're going to have to pay tax on those. So looking at different types of tools to be able to give, giving from your IRA is a great way to go about it. And there's something out there called the Qualified Charitable Distribution. And maybe we can hop to the next slide. I'm not sure if it's on the next slide or the slide after, but you can gift from your IRA and now your heirs don't have to pay taxes on that asset. If you're giving to the American Heart Association and you are giving uh, cash now, or uh, an asset, that's great. Assets are even better because you're saving taxes that you would have to pay on appreciation of that asset. So I, I love giving of assets, but looking at your IRA and how it is going to pass to the next generation, know that it's gonna be taxed and they've put a limit of only a 10 year stretch on it right now. So your kids are gonna to have to take out all that money over 10 years. That should probably be one of the first assets that you look at gifting from, especially if you're 70 and a half, you can do this qualified charitable distribution from your IRA. Another component of that is making it uh, who is the beneficiary. With a simple uh, beneficiary designation form, you can include your children and charity, or you could just have it all go to charity and give your children the assets that will get a step up in basis at death. Meaning if you have a, uh, a rental property and you pass away with it, it is now going to go to the value at the time of your death and pass to your children that way. So they're not going to owe any taxes on it. And it looks, Laura, like you have another question for us. Well, actually, I don't have a question. There were a ton of questions that came in, but due to the amazing conversation you've been having, we are at time. And so I just wanted to say all the amazing questions that came in will be answered in a follow-up email. And I was just jumping in here to say thank you, Tiffany and Mary, for such a fantastic presentation and letting us know so much about all of this. And we are at time. So I just wanted to say thank you again. We'll answer the questions in a follow-up email. And if you haven't received the complimentary guide to securing a future, it's not too late. You can request the guide and other materials by visiting www.heart.org plan. And as we heard today, working with an attorney is always a great idea, especially for complex estates. For those less complex estates, the association has partnered with Free Will to provide you with a simple, free, and easy way to create a legal will. Simply scan the QR code on the screen to begin your free will. We'll include the links for both of these resources in the chat and follow-up email. Be sure to keep an eye on those. And on the behalf of the American Heart Association, thank you again for joining us today. I want to thank you, Tiffany and Mary, for such a great presentation. We encourage you to contact us anytime if you have questions. We have staff throughout the country that are here to support you. And please email us at plannedgiving at heart.org or visit our website, heart.org slash plannedgiving to find a dedicated advisor in your area. Lastly, as we conclude today, Please provide our team with your feedback on today's presentation by completing our short survey. The survey will pop up in your browser immediately following the webinar. And thank you again and goodbye. Thank you.